You never want to see anyone traded. Noah was such a good guy, a hard worker. I hope Chicago is a good opportunity for him. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at Basketball Monster and you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Make sure, if you haven't already, check out the Trade Deadline podcast myself and Greg Ehrenberg recorded earlier today. We had multitudes of technical difficulties with the live stream. It didn't end up going out live. I tried Periscope. I tried Facebook Live. It didn't work, but the show is there in audio and in video form. And in fact, halfway through, Greg uh, dropped out. And he had to, uh, he had to uh, run back in, and things didn't get all that dangerous, but we did discuss all the moves in, uh, in the trade deadline. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it in today's show. Not much, but you can hear all of our thoughts uh, across on that earlier podcast, plus all the projections have been updated over on Basketball Monster. The big winners for me, fantasy-wise, are Larry Nance, uh, Georgie Hill, uh, DJ Augustine are the three major winners, I think. There's some value there for Brook Lopez, uh, the future MVP, Kyle Kuzma, Julius Randle gets a bump. There's numerous guys who get m- m- minor bumps, but for players who are generally available, Hill, Nance, and Augustine are the three guys who get the largest bump, in my opinion, after the uh, trade deadline shenanigans all went down. Let's start with the monstrous line of the night, and it goes to Kemba Walker of the Charlotte Hornets. 40 points, one rebound, three assists, four steals, 13 of 26 from the field, and eight of eight from the free throw line. Kemba was rightfully named to the All-Star team. He should have been in ahead of Goran Dragic. You've heard me say that plenty of times. He's finally in there now. I'm disappointed, of course, that Ben Simmons didn't get in there, but doesn't matter because Kemba absolutely deserved this spot. He's been fantastic yet again this year, averaging 23, three and a half, and six with three triples, 1.2 steals. The field goal percentage has been a little bit down as as to where it was the last uh, last season at 44%. It's at 43 this season, but over the last month he has been ramping it up even further. The 17th ranked player, averaging 27 points with six assists and almost four triples per game. And giving you half a block a game, he has been a a real star over the last few years. Three consecutive top 30 seasons for Kemba Walker as he has ramped up his ability to score, his shooting percentages. Uh, It's weird that he was like a 38, 39% guy, then became a 43% guy. Just a one season, 4% increase, and that's it. Now he stays at that level, and that pushed him to be a 20-point per game scorer, of course, obviously. He did not get traded by the Charlotte Hornets, another one of those things that when you hear all this talk that goes out, the majority of those moves don't actually happen, and we saw that, and it's something I talked about with Greg earlier today. All these, every player, oh, DeAndre Jordan, man, is definitely getting traded. Tyreek, got to sell low. Lou Williams, got to sell him off for you know, uh, two pieces of shit and a 20-cent coin because, oh, they're definitely getting traded. Like None of that stuff actually happened, and most of the deals that went down were things that we hadn't heard of. Yes, we'd heard of George Hill moving. We'd heard of Rocket Rodney Hood. We'd heard of both of those moves uh, happening, but we hadn't heard of Isaiah Thomas going to the Lakers. That wasn't something that had come up. You know, Jim Ennis moving to Detroit, not that that's a big move, but we hadn't heard anything of that. And that, yeah, Dwayne Wade going back to, back to Miami, completely out of left field. Like, this is the the stuff that does happen with trades. It's not usually the stuff that's widely reported. Nerlens Noel's getting traded, apparently. Got to make sure we stash him. Just all, all this sort of stuff. It just, majority of the time, does not happen. The waiver wire line of the night goes to Mick Beasley of the New York Knicks. 21-7 and seven for Mick. An assist, three steals and a block. 7 of 13 from the field. 7 of 7 from the free throw line. I said it the other day when, when Porzingis got injured. Porzingis. That you had to own Michael Beasley. You have to own Michael Beasley. It's pretty straightforward. He is a guy that's going to have significant usage. His efficiency has been up the last three seasons. He has shot over 50% from the field, 52 in 15-16, 53 last year, and he's at 51 this season. The usage is going to be up. Um, He's going to be getting some boards. He's not going to do much defensive-wise, but he can do a little bit in those areas, but it's going to be scoring on decent efficiency, high-volume scoring. He is a must-own player. That's not really a trade deadline situation, but he is a must-own guy. So make sure that Michael Beasley is not on your way. Look, your team might be just super, super ridiculously strong, and 
Um, Beasley can't fit, and, and that's fine. But he is a bloke I think is going to be a top 80 guy for the rest of the season. So calibrate that with who else you've got. You might think someone's strong, but they might be a top 110 guy. Then maybe you drop that guy or you trade them in your league to try and get Beasley in. But make sure you have a look and see, at least explore that opportunity of getting Michael Beasley onto your team. The young gun of the night is Dennis Smith Jr. of the Dallas Mavericks. 22 for Smitty in 30 minutes. Four triples, three rebounds, three assists, two steals, and a block. A big performance from him. I've been singing his praises all season as a second-half breakout guy. It's been a rough two weeks for Smith owners, considering he's shooting 32% on 16 attempts, which has absolutely torpedoed his value. But if you ignore that part of it, which generally you would have to do to have him anyway, he's averaged 14, 4, and 6.5 and with 1.3 triples and one steal. And of course, the 14 points he averaged, if he shot 45% instead of 32%, then we're talking about 17, 4, and 6.5 and numbers, which clearly push him further up. The removal of Devin Harris from this rotation, not that Harris really ever played any point guard minutes, but it means you're going to get a little bit more Yogi Ferrell and JJ Barea at the two, which maybe gives an extra minute or two there to Dennis Smith. And make, again, make sure that he is owned. I'm sure that he is in your league. He's owned in every single one of my leagues, of course. Go and have a look if he is around, uh, and I'll be owning him, assuming that you can deal with the field goal percentage, which uh, has been a problem, but it wasn't too bad in this game against the Warriors. The dud of the night. Timmy Hardaway Jr., 9-5 and five with a triple for Tim, 4 of 14 from the field. It has not been a strong run from Hardaway in the last four games. He has been the 314th ranked player since he returned from his uh, from his injury, he is the 159th ranked player that has dropped his numbers down. But in large part, much like he struggles at the start of the year, it's due to poor shooting. 38% from the field since he's returned. 31% from three. And over the last seven games, he's shooting 29 from the field and 17 from three. Almost mirroring those numbers that we saw from Hardaway in those first four games of the season that caused everyone to drop him in mass panic mode. I, hopefully we've all learnt our lesson about it and we know that this run of 29 and 17 as his shooting percentages won't continue. In fact, over the last four games, he's at 9% from three. These are numbers that quite clearly aren't going to be able to continue in this manner and they will bump back up. He'll get some extra usage with Porzingis out. Um, and we're just going to wait for the shots to start to fall and they will. It was good to see him play through this after he copped that kick in the leg in the last game and wasn't able to return. So it looks like the injury there is fine for Timmy Hardaway Jr. Just wasn't a good performance for him. Actually, I haven't even told you who we're doing for uh, the player spotlight today. I should have mentioned that. We are going to preview the nine games for Friday, and we're going to do the player spotlight today on Emmanuel Moutier of the New York Knicks, now traded from the Denver Nuggets. So he is going to be the player spotlight. We'll go straight, though, now into question time. And today's question comes from T-Boss, who's on Twitter at Duncan's Last Noel. And he says, are there any Australian actors who are working in Hollywood that are particularly beloved by the people of Australia? Now, I, I'm not sure particularly beloved is the right way of classifying it. I'm not really sure that there are many people that capture the majority of Australia. We're not really a beloved type of culture. Maybe someone who else is Australian can correct me on that. I don't think we go, oh man, everyone's so super proud of what Russell Crowe's doing. I don't think anyone's really thinking that. Uh, or along any sort of stretch. But there are people who, I guess, um, we don't hate. And maybe that's the better way of, uh, of phrasing that. Um, Chris Hemsworth, I think, is uh, fairly universally not necessarily loved or beloved, but, but liked and appreciated over here. Uh, Margot Robbie, definitely someone in that category as well. Um, Hugh Jackman, I don't think, has too many detractors over here in Australia. Probably those three were the three names, well, not probably, those three were definitely the three names that immediately came to my mind. Um, another thing that completely nothing to do with being beloved in Australia, but something that I never knew about, but many of you would have watched the uh, show on Netflix, 13 Reasons Why. I didn't know that uh, was it Hannah. Yeah, I didn't know that Hannah, the act, the actress that plays the character Hannah, the main character, was Australian. I had no idea. Her name's Catherine Langford. Found that out a few months ago. I was completely floored that I that that the main character from that show, Thirteen Reasons Why, was Australian. Absolutely stunned. Um, 
and just in case anybody asks, Nicole Kidman is not beloved over here. She is, uh, she's not really uh, liked by a huge, huge, maybe I'm just projecting my own thoughts. I am not a Nicole Kidman fan at all. Maybe there are people, maybe people do class her as a national treasure. I don't think that that's necessarily the case, but I would put those other guys like Hemsworth, Jackman, and Robbie as the uh, as the three actors who came to my mind as, you know, you don't really see much negativity uh, going around about them, and that's a the best way of um of judging popularity in Australia, I guess. Let's move on and talk about the action from the games that actually did go down on uh, on Thursday. There were six of those games for us to talk about. The first one, the Atlanta Hawks and the Orlando Magic. Marco Bellinelli, who was sent home to be traded, wasn't traded, so he uh, he didn't play this game, but he will be back now. Whether he is in the rotation or not remains to be seen. But what I liked, what I saw here and, and liked was Ersan Ilyasova playing just 15 minutes, but we do have to remember that he did have some foul trouble. Whether he sticks in that limited role, his minutes had already been start to, started to be reduced, and they closed the game with the Baptist, John Collins, and the Undertaker in the front court. The Baptist played 26. He had 9 and 12 with a steal and two blocks, and while no one was traded in that front court, the push forward for him to get minutes is still a possibility, and I'm still holding. The artist formerly known as Torian Prince had a nice game, 19, 1 and 5. Fine for 12 team leagues. I'd put him behind Nance and Hill and uh, DJ Augustine in terms of guys to add, but he is uh, he's got some value. Kenty e. Bazemore had some foul issues, 6-4-4 four, and four with two blocks, while Schroeder had 19-5-5. Five, and five. Still 18 minutes for Miles Plumley is absolutely not necessary in any year, in any history of any alternate universe of the NBA. I just don't know why that continues to persist. First man off the bench for this team was Tyler Dorsey. 25 minutes, 11, 5, and 3. Didn't do you know, much, but 25 minutes is interesting for those of you in deep leagues. Whether he can hold that role when Ballinelli returns remains to be seen. But I think that in 20-teamers and maybe 18-team leagues, he is someone to pay some level of attention to. On the Magic, we know they traded away Alfred Payton for a second-round pick. and A crazy move, in my opinion. You can say whatever you want about Payton not being your point guard in the future. But getting a, a second round pick, it's, I just don't, I don't get it. Especially when you, you don't have any other point guard prospects on your radar. Are you hoping a free agent comes? Are you hoping you get one in the draft? I don't know. It, it seemed like a weird move for very little return. But in saying that, it's opened up minutes for DJ Augustin and Shelvin Mack. Augustin was the clear winner in this one. 35 minutes, 18, 3, and 9, two steals and two triples. I went early and said yeah, that Augustine was the guy to own. And, and a few people pushed back. Oh, what about Shelvin Mack? Shouldn't you be looking at Mack instead? He, he's younger. Um, and I yeah, introduced a little bit of doubt into my head. Oh, maybe they go with Mack. I, I still stuck with Augustine. And it obviously panned out in this game. That's the way that um, that I, I'm leaning that they're going to run for the rest of the, of the season. I don't think that it'll be 35 minutes for him and just 22 for Mack in most of these games. But I think that DJ is going to be the guy to add there. Mack is more of a deeper league player. Fournier will also get a little bit more in terms of ball handling responsibility as as may, may John Simmons. But again, I don't think he's that good. 13-1-1 one, one for Simo in 34, while Fournier had 22-3-3. Three, and three. Still no Aaron Gordon, no Nick Vucevic. He wasn't available. Bismack had 10-7 and seven with three steals, but that run is coming to a very, very sudden crashing halt. While Hazonia had 8-10 and 10 with three steals in 29 minutes. A quick reminder, Hazonia does not have value when Gordon comes back. I've seen people asking me if he's a top 75 player for the rest of the season. And while I like what he's doing, that's just not a feasible outcome, I don't think. I can't see any way that something like that uh, happens. The next game we take a look at is the New York Knicks and the Toronto Raptors. Beasley was already huge. We talked about that. But uh, how about Lukey Cornett in his first NBA game? Cornett, 22 minutes, 11 and 10, three triples and four blocks. That is a huge performance. I saw some crazy ad drop type questions like, do I add Cornett or Torian Prince? I think was one of them that I saw. And this is a great performance from Cornett, but we do have to remember that Ennis Cantor was out. This is literally Cornett's first game of the season, and it came because Hernan Gomez was traded, Noah is away, Porzingis is injured, and Cantor is out. Now, a couple of those things aren't changing. Hernan Gomez isn't coming back, Noah's not going to be a part of the rotation, and Porzingis isn't coming back. But Cantor's going to come back and get his 27 minutes. So Cornett is not going to have this larger role or or be that productive in every game. He's a really good shooting three-point big man who can block shots. So he's almost like a, a, a mini Porzingis in terms of a statistical profile, but he's just not going to play enough minutes 
to really be sniffing around 12 team value unless you think that they just eliminate what Kylo Quinn does in, ti- in, t- in its entirety and play 22 minutes for Cornet each night. And even if they did, I don't think he's putting up this level. Sure, deeper leagues, yeah, absolutely. 20 teamers, let's have a go. He, he's the third string center now on this team. That's pretty clear. Um, you can go and add him in 20s and 30 team leagues, all that sort of thing. But in, uh, in 12s and 14s, I reckon you might be pushing it. No idea what's going to happen with the point guards. We, you know, The Knicks keep saying they want to play younger players, and they pulled Frank Nilakina so they could close the game with Jarrett Jack. So I just don't know what to believe with this team at all. Jack had 10-2-6 and six in 23. Nilakina played 21 minutes, while Trey Burke played only 13 and had 12-2-3. and three. And then we're going to add Emmanuel Moutier into that mix. So there's four point guards there. Maybe they eliminate Jack from the rotation. That would be the smart thing to do. We don't know whether that will actually happen, though. And even then, like... Frank's not getting 30 a night. Moutier is not getting 30 a night. It's going to be some sort of weird minute split between those guys with Burke chipping in a couple there and playing a little bit at shooting guard also. We're really rendering none of those guys must-own players. Many people are thinking that Moutier is a must-own guy. I, I, I cannot... Like, he wasn't a must-own guy getting 30 minutes in Denver. He hasn't been good this season. We're going to talk about him later on. And the fact that Nilakina is there, it's far from a slam dunk that he is getting large minutes. For the uh, Raptors... Balanchunas, another big game, 18 and 10 with two steals and a block in 24 minutes. And this is another huge blowout for the Raptors. They're a plus 85 in their last four games. So we're seeing the minutes reduced for many guys, Serge Barker, Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan, because they're just smashing the shit out of these teams and we're getting their bench to really run in and play big minutes. Freddie Van Vliet had 10 and 6 with three steals in his 24 minutes, another strong performance. But when the games get closer, he won't play 24. DeLon Wright won't go and play 22 necessarily. He had 11, 3, and 3. And it's all fine and dandy. And in, in games where there's large spreads, maybe you can stream those guys in, but I don't think they're really 12-team guys. Bad game from DeRozan, 8, 5, and 5. Well, Lowry had 7, 2, and 3. Some of that poor shooting, well, actually, a lot of it poor shooting, but a lot of it also the fact that their minutes were quite reduced given the blowout nature of the game. The Boston Celtics and the Washington Wizards, this game went to overtime. Kyrie had 28, and 6. Sorry, 28, 5, and 6 with a triple one. A strong game from him. Jalen Brown, 18, 4, and 3, filled up the stats. And Al Horford had 12 and 7 with two blocks there as well. Also, a ton of minutes for Marcus Morris in this game. 36 minutes for Morris, 15 and 8 with a 3 and a steal. Probably the most, I think it's the most minutes he's played at all in his Celtics uh, career so far. We also had the debut of Greg Monroe. He played 11 minutes straight in the second quarter. Ended up with 20 minutes, 5 and 6 with two steals. Uh, Vanilla Tice played 28 minutes, 7 and 6, and Bainsey had 14 minutes, 2 and 5 with a steal on a block. The way that these minutes are shaking out, and when Marcus Smart returns, it could put a further clamp on Munro's minutes. I don't think that he is a 12-team league guy. Yeah, he might only need 24 minutes to be that guy, but I don't think he's getting 24 minutes. Shemi Ojale, Abdul Nadir were out of the rotation in this game as Munro replaced them, but it's still, and look, you probably can assume that Tice isn't going to play 28 minutes a night, so there's eight minutes there that can go somewhere, but again, Marcus Smart has to come back and take some of that playing time. So Munro could be, if you've missed out on every other option, you could have a look at him. He looked okay, but nothing that I look at and think, yeah, that's a spectacular performance. Jason Tatum's shooting was uh, well off in this one as well, missed all three of his triples. For the Wizards, they went back to more of Thomas Satoransky at point guard and Beal at shooting guard. Satoransky had 14, 4, and 4 with two blocks and two triples. I think he's really good. I think he's a strong, strong defender and a really good offensive player. The concern we've been having is Beal playing point guard and getting Ubre in there more. I think that Satoransky is a better player than Ubre. I've said that multiple times over the past couple of seasons. He is absolutely fine to own in 12 team leagues, but the jerking around of minutes might be a concern. Porter had 27 and 11, a big game from him, while Beal had 18, 5, 9 assists, 2 steals. 26% shooting. I talked about him in the player spotlight yesterday, talking about his assist numbers and how they were rising. Another uh, showing of that. Well, Markeith had 9, 5, and 5, and Gortat played 31 minutes, 10 and 10 with a steal and a block. Gortat had struggled to even get to 20 minutes recently with Mahinmi out playing him. That wasn't the case here. Ubre 11 and 6 in 33. You can leave Gortat and Ubre out of 12 team league consideration, in uh, my opinion. The Charlotte Hornets and the Portland Trailblazers. 
Frank the Tank Kaminsky was terrible when Marvin Williams was out. Williams returned, so Kaminsky goes off. 30 minutes for him in the overtime, 17 and 6, four triples and two steals. I would read exactly zero into this. Williams had 10 and 4 in his 23. While Batum, a strong overall performance, 11 2 5 with four steals. People are still holding on to Jeremy Lamb in 12 team leagues. Yes. It is happening, and no, it should not happen. You need to move on from Jeremy Lamb. Seven points in 21 minutes there for him. While Dwight Howard, Dwight, who was allegedly getting traded uh, away so that Willie Hernan Gomez can play, he had seven and 15 in 39 minutes with one block. For the Blazers, this is great from uh, Yusuf Nurkic. 24 and 14, two steals and four blocks. This is the, the March Yusuf Nurkic we saw last year. The big minutes are a real plus. Whether he can continue that remains to be seen, but it's a, it's a positive to see it happen. Lillard, 18, 4, and 8, while uh, the chief, Al Farouk Aminu. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. He shot poorly, 6 points on 29%, but 15 boards and 3 steals continues just to give him a, a sliver of standard league value. Not, not a guy that I do consider a must-own. You've heard me say that all the time. I'm just going to bring up what his numbers look like. He's the 108th ranked player this season, 112th over the last month, and they're fine numbers. Yeah, poor field goal percentage. He's a strong rebounder. He gets some steals. It really does depend on your team, and therefore not a must-own guy. Mo Harkless started over Evan Turner, played 32 minutes, had 8 and Five. That's not happening. Well, it's not doing anything for us in fantasy. While well, Turner had 13 and two in his return, I'm not really certain how that role is going to play out as we move forward. Um, the next game we're going to take a look at the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Los Angeles Lakers. No Russell Westbrook, no Carmelo Anthony. So this rotation, it doesn't really mean anything with those guys out. We had Patrick Patterson starting. He didn't do anything. Jeremy Grant off the bench had a couple of blocks. And if Melo's out again, you can stream Grant in for some defensive stats. Paulie George did 29-9 and nine with five triples in a game that they got blown out by. The Lakers, we saw the appearance of Daniel Hamilton, who played a little bit of backup point guard. Fat face Ray Felton was the starter. He was okay. Actually, he was, he was below average. Really very little to talk about with this Thunder team because you know, this is a game that P.J. Dozier played two minutes in. If you, if you didn't know that P.J. Dozier actually exists... Well, that, uh, that should explain to you just how bad this uh, game was, just in terms of the players who were out there. We had 13 minutes of Terrence Ferguson out there. He did nothing, so he really couldn't get a huge boost, even with Westbrook out. Uh, and it's Abrines and Hustis who are getting the bulk of that playing time, but neither of them are close to standard league guys. Hard to get a full judge on what to make of the Lakers. A huge winner from them, obviously. They're going to have Isaiah Thomas, Lonzo Ball, and Channing Fry rejoin this rotation. Lonzo is going to continue to start. Isaiah will come off the bench but play a lot of minutes. They've also got Kentavious Caldwell-Pope and then Josh Hart in that backcourt as well. So you, you would think by process of elimination that Hart is the fourth guard there. So the numbers have been putting up have been great. 10, 8, and 5 in 33 minutes. Really solid stuff from, uh, from the hitman in this one. But... When you add two guards to the mix who are going to play over 30 minutes, he's just not going to have that opportunity anymore. So while he's fine now to own, it's not going to last, I don't think. Brook Lopez surging up a little bit, 24 minutes, 9-9 nine and nine with a block, but we had Ivica Zubats entered into the rotation in this game after he'd been uh, missing all year pretty much, 7-5 and five for Zubats, um, coming in and taking those Nance minutes. Ran uh, not Randall, uh, Lopez is a guy to own in 12-team uh, leagues just to see how this plays out. The future MVP had 16-9, and nine, added some defensive numbers, and that helps. A steal in two blocks, he should be owned while Randall, 17-6. and six. There was also a good game from Corwell Pope. I'll give him a little bit of shit, but 20 points on 70% shooting. It's great. It's also not going to continue to happen. So he is, I think he's still a 12-team league guy. As for guys like Isaiah Thomas coming across, yeah, I think he should be better. He should have higher usage in LA. But it's it's more that the hip and the lack of athleticism and, and the finishing that's a it's a bother for him. But I think he can have you know some decently strong numbers. But I do worry about him not uh, realizing that he shouldn't be jacking shots when he's not hitting them, and it's going to be even more pronounced in LA. Another strong game from Ingram as well, nineteen two and six playing point guard. His value is going to dip when the ball comes out of his hands when Ball and Thomas are back for the Lakers. Last game of the night, the Dallas Mavericks and the Golden State Warriors talked about Devin Harris. 
leaving Dougie McDermott comes in. So I think McDermott basically just slides in and takes nearly all of those um, all of those minutes from Harris. Not going to be a fantasy guy. We know that he'd need 74 minutes per game to actually sniff top 100 value. Dwight Powell, 31 minutes, 18 and 6, two steals. These are four strong games in a row that he has started. Yes, Nerland's Noel, they're making noise that he's going to come back and we're going to see him on the court. I absolutely don't trust it. And I think if anyone's going to lose the minutes, it's going to be Maxi Kleber and it's going to be Salah Mejri. If anyone's losing minutes for Noel, it's going to be those blokes, not necessarily Powell. He is a high percentage, uh, high free throw for a big, high field goal, blocks and steals sort of a guy that can have these occasional offensive outbursts. 18 and 6 is a strong night for Powell and he is a 12-team league guy. Dirk was also great, 16 and 11 with five steals and two blocks. He's never going to be this good in any other game in the rest of his career. I'm pretty confident in saying, but it was good to see the old man throw it out there and get some of those defensive numbers. You can look to Dirk as a 12-team league guy for sure. Well, J.J. Barea played 28 minutes in this one. He started over Yogi Ferrell. Ferrell's not a 12-teamer. Barea is a borderline one who does have that value, not mainly, entirely because of his assists. The Warriors, there's nothing to talk about really with what uh, with what they do. Duran had 24-9. and nine. Curry had 27-8. and eight. David West with another strong night. 10-7-7, seven and seven, a steal and a block. He has been absolutely awesome on a permanent minute basis this year, Westy, but still that's only happening for deeper leagues, while Draymond almost got the uh, the Richie Benno, 10, 12, 10 and 6 with two steals and two blocks, also got himself his 14th technical, so he's two away from getting suspended, and Clay had 18, 5 and 4, just the Warriors are the least exciting team to talk about for fantasy, because nothing seems to change, especially with Jordan Bell out. All right, that's, uh, that's going to do it for the action from Thursday. As I mentioned, go back and listen to the uh, the trade deadline show for more thoughts on those trader guys. I'll throw some other stuff in as we go through the rest of this show. I'm going to come back and do that player spotlight on Emmanuel Moutier, uh, and then we're going to preview a nine-game Friday for DFS. <laughs> Let's now have a look at the player spotlight. And today's player spotlight is a recently traded player, and that is Emmanuel Moutier, now of the New York Knicks, formerly of the Denver Nuggets. He's still pretty young. He has yet to turn 22. He was the seventh pick in the 2015 draft, but he has struggled throughout his career. His first year in Denver, he was the 170th ranked player and played over 30 minutes per game there. But to be fair to him, over the second half of the year, he did come on quite strong and his shot started to come around. He averaged 13, 3.5, and 5.5 and and with a steal and a 3, but it was his percentages that really dragged him down, 36 and 67. He's got the free throws figured out. 78 in his second season, 81% this year. But the other numbers haven't really come around. In fairness to him, he's shooting 38% from three this season on, of course, much fewer attempts because he's barely played. And he's 101 attempts, which is not bad. But yeah, his first two seasons, he was at uh, 400 attempts combined. So he's a little bit down there, but shooting at the ball much better. Averaging this year, if we look at his per 36 numbers, 17, 4.5, and, and 6 
with two triples and a steal, 40 and 81 as his percentages, which is you know, not overly sensational or anything along those lines. Now, as I highlighted earlier on, when talking about the Knicks, we've still got Frank Nilakina there, who Jeff Hornacek keeps talking about and you know, keeps, oh, I don't know if we're going to start him. Maybe he gets to that spot. Yeah, Frank is there. Frank is significantly a better defender than what Moutier is. I think he's a better passer, and I think he's a better deep shooter. Whether he's a better overall offensive player because Moody has got the ability to be stronger and to drive and to, and to get closer to the rim, uh, that that remains to be seen. But in those other areas, I think that he does uh, does have him covered. Now, Moody is not not the greatest finisher. He is fifty uh, percent at the rim this year, fifty one last year, forty eight last season or the season before. Like that's that's pretty horrible. He doesn't really shoot the ball well from every, everywhere, so he can get to the rim. He just doesn't. Uh, he just doesn't shoot it well. And thirty percent of all of his shots are in that zero to three feet range. And when you can't finish it, that's a real problem for a guy who then can't hit many of his shots from other areas. Um, on off wise, he's been a disaster the last two seasons. Negative eight point nine last year, negative three point six this season. You know the PER has been okay, um, but box score plus minus doesn't like him. Win shares don't like him. Twelve and a half PER this season. It's his third season. He should be looking to take a step forward, but he's been clearly um, outplayed and and out of the rotation in uh, in. Um, in Denver and and now heads to New York. Now there is an opportunity for him here. There's there's no doubt about that. That that there is um, there is an opportunity for him heading to New York. But I don't necessarily think that he is you know, this great superb option that uh, is going to be putting um, up top 100 numbers. I'm not not to judge him totally on his rookie season, but he did play 30 minutes there and struggled. Um, and, and he can be better than that, but I just I don't look. If you miss out on these other guys, Hill and and Augustine and whoever else it is that's around, I notice many people, some people are pushing back on me saying that Nance is a must own guy. I, uh, I comfortably think that he is because of what he does, but it's not it's not for everyone really because he contributes in in different categories. Not a high usage guy, and a lot of people get blinded by the points category. But uh, that's uh, digressing. Emudier yeah, still has a little bit of hope. He's been yeah, fairly much one of the. I think he was the worst, one of the worst rookies in NBA history in his rookie season from an efficiency point of view, uh, and just overall advanced stats. He was just terrible, and not much has changed for him. There is there is a level of hope um, that that he can change things. The opportunity is going to be presented to him, but it's not a slam dunk walk into big minute spot. Burke, Nilakina, Jack, who's probably out of the rotation. And Moutier now there battling for minutes in New York. We haven't had a settled starter or a big minute role for anybody really in New York. And I don't think that this addition really changes all that much for Moutier. Long term, I have very little faith in him uh, as well. He can do some things well. I was I was a decent fan of his. Uh, and he's cut some things down like his turnovers this year, which is, uh, which is an impressive thing to, to do that. Uh, but I, I still, especially recently, I still just don't love it for him for this season. And I don't really love his long-term ability. I'd rather Frank out there. I think Frank's shown more uh, a higher level of uh, IQ with passing, efficiency, and defense. And they're things that you like seeing from a young player because a lot of the other stuff can develop. Let's go to the uh, perfect DFS lineups for Thursday. On Fangel, DJ Augustin had 41.1. Kemba had 54.7. Beal, 42.5. While Kentavious Caldwell Pope had 32.9. Otto Porter, 47.2. Durant had 49.8. The future MVP, Kyle Kuzma, had 38.8. Dirk had 51.7. And Yusuf Nurkic had 53.3 for a total of 412. And that cost $59,400. On DraftKings, we got Kyrie at 47.5, Augustine at 40.25, Otto Porter at 49.75, Dirk at 47.25, Nurkic 53, Kemba 55.25, Luke Cornett at 34.5, and Paulie George at 50.25, and that's a total of 377.75, and that cost $49,200. dues. just a quick, I was going to say, what's a reverse shout out? The ESPN Fantasy does not even have Luke Cornett available as a player. That is an absolute outrage. He's a player that's in the NBA. He wasn't signed yesterday. He's been signed since the start of the year on a two-way contract. The fact that he is not even available is just absolutely horrendous, ESPN. 
get your finger, pull it out of your ass and get to work on that keyboard and get a guy like, get literally at the start of the year, every single player on an NBA roster needs to be available. If, if Kobe Bryant's still available to draft, then Luke Cornett should be available to pick up. That is just uh, not not ideal, would be uh, the kindest way of me putting it. Not that I need to be kind after I said they should pull their finger out of their ass. Let's have a look at the action from... Um, or for, tu- uh, for Tuesday, Jesus, we're going backwards in the week, for Friday. Remember, there are going to be many players who were traded who won't be playing in these games, so some value is uh, definitely going to uh, definitely going to, to open up. Um, not so much in this game, necessarily. The Pistons are favored by 3.5, and, and the total is 217 Point five points for the Clippers. Austin Rivers is questionable, and Milos Teodosic is also questionable. So some interesting things could change there. Ty Wallace may be out of the rotation, or he could be playing 30 minutes a night. There just we just don't know how that's going to pan out for Detroit. It's unlikely that Jim Ennis is ready to go. I don't know how Ennis is going to fit in in this rotation. Will he take minutes away from Stan Johnson, Reggie Bullock, Luke Kennard? It, I'd probably think not. Um, the other guy that they received is Jameer Nelson in the trade as well, and I don't think he's going to be uh, any sort of DFS impact guy and not sure if he's going to even be ready to play in this one either. At point guard, Ish Smith's at 6,100. An, an okay matchup for Ish. I think there's a little bit of upside there for him, but not one that I'd really be overly keen on. Milos, uh, Langston Galloway, Austin Rivers, I wouldn't be using either of those guys. At shooting guard, Canard's down to 3,600 because his role has gotten smaller after Avery Bradley got traded because the logic there is uh, is right on. While Lou Williams at 6,800 now, I'm absolutely fine with that. You can get a huge boost if Milos and Rivers are out. It could be a big night from Lou. Um, but that salary has come down quite a lot because his production has tailed off now. We know that Lou Williams clearly did not get traded. I, I, uh, try again. Avery Bradley, 4,600 for Brattles. A decent game for him in the last one, 27 points. He is worth looking at if Milosh and Rivers are both out because that gives him an opportunity, but he has just not been good for the majority of this season. Reggie Bullock's at 4,600. That's more tournament than anything. Well, Stan Johnson at 6,100 on Fangio. I think Stan's been, or I know Stan's been playing well, but I don't think he's been playing well enough to justify that sort of a salary. The Rooster at 6,700 absolutely can be used. He has been crushing it, high usage, doing what he did in his time in Denver. I'm okay with using uh, Gallinari in tournaments and in cash. At power forward, the table, Montrez Harrell, 4,300. A few guys that are still listening that play seasonal leagues, and if you stashed him, or you can forget that, he is done. DeAndre Jordan didn't get moved. Shock. Uh, while Toby Harris at 7,100, I actually think he is a strong cash play here. Tone Tolliver at 43 for the Pistons is a GPP upside guy as well with his three-point shooting and his ability to play minutes. 9,200 for Blake Griffin. Um, we love what Blake's been doing. Is that a little bit too high? Maybe, but I think he's got a really safe floor, so he's not a not a bad cash option. While at center, we've got Andre Drummond and DeAndre Jordan, Spider-Man uh, memeing each other, which is that's not really fair to Drummond. He is a much different player to, uh, to Jordan. They just get lumped in together because of their inability to shoot threes and free throws, although Drummond has changed that this year. 7,600 for Jordan, 11-2 for Drummo. That is an absolutely astronomical amount for Drummo, mainly because he's averaging 61 points over his last five. I would not be interested in spending 11,200 on him. As for DeAndre at 76, he struggled against Drummond in the past. He's not putting up numbers anywhere near that. In fact, I think both of these guys are in that fade territory. Let's have a look on DraftKings at this one. Uh, I like the Rooster at 65. I like, I like Stan Johnson way more on DraftKings. He's at 5,100. That's a strong price. Reggie Bullock at 45 and Tone Tolliver at 41 are some tournament options. Drummond also more usable at 10 to a full thousand dollars cheaper than over on Fangio. So that's an option. DeAndre at 7,000 also, I think, has a little bit of GPP upside there for him. All right, let's uh, go to the to the next game. We're going to look at... We're going to look at... Um, the Pelicans and the 76ers. The Sixers are favored by five and a half, and the total is 221.5 points in this one. Uh, Markel Fultz is out. We, we know that much. Dante Cunningham was traded for the from the Pelicans for Rashad Vaughn. That's not going to have any impact in DFS. Cunningham was a DMPCD in the last game. 
uh, or the last game that they actually played, not the one they were supposed to play. Interesting to see if they stick with the Rondo on the bench and DeAndre Liggins starting that was supposed to happen against the Pacers and then didn't happen because of the leak. That would be uh, an interesting uh, thing. And I assume that it will, but we don't know that for sure. TJ McConnell is at 3,800. A nice game from him in the last one, but had been pretty subpar prior to that. I don't really see any upside or safe floor. Rondo at 48 is a fade. Jared Bayless at 35 not happening either. JJ Redick at 5,400 is okay, but I think it's limited upside, low floor, and you know how I feel about those. Well, Drew Holiday at 76. I love Drew here. This is a 40-point upside. Oh, shit, that's a 50-point upside, almost a 40-point not quite floor, but yeah, realistic expectation is 40 points for Drew here. Has played well against the Sixers in the past and is doing very well, of course, in all of his other games. At small forward, Bob covers at 5,700. Tournaments for Covington, never looking at him for cash. Well, eats one more at 45. I, I don't really like the upside there on him. John Red Liggins, I don't, he's a shooting guard. I don't think there's any DFS value there. Dario Saric at 7,100. I think that's probably a little bit high for Saric. The matchup is not bad. I could use him in a tournament, but I wouldn't like it for cash. Well, Miritich is at 7,000. Now, I would favor Miritich over Saric if I'm using one of those guys in a tournament. Benny Simmons at 8,700. They continue to list him as a power forward. He's not a power forward. 8,700 for Simo. He had 46 the last time against the Pelicans. That's not... That's you know, that's there's no reason why that won't happen again. So I think that he is a, an okay cash guy with a safe floor and a decent upside. Amir Johnson, Trevor Booker, no, check Diallo. Yeah, Diallo's been alright. He's getting 15 minutes a night. Dante Cunningham's not going to cut into his playing time. He, he is averaging 20 points in his last three games, Diallo, when he's played 15 minutes in those games. So there is something there, but probably not much you want to use. Joel Embiid, 10,400. He matches up against Anthony Davis. Hasn't done well in their past matchups, but I still think that he has got 50-point upside, clearly, and he is a GPP guy, whereas Tone Davis at 11-7 has done well against the Sixers. 54-point average, some of that with Embiid, some of it without at 11-7, he's absolutely in play, and he should be in play almost every night on every slate, but not the guy that I'm looking at to lock in as a, as a number one option. On DraftKings, very little that I look at and I absolutely love. Sharich at 6,300 stands out in this game as probably the best value, and Embiid at 980 is also really strong. Davis at 11-1, yeah, that's that's fine. Simmons at 85, yeah. Miritich at 6-8, I think there's still some strong value in that. Also, while well, Drew at 7,800 is probably just a little bit too high, I believe. All right, let's go on to the next one. We have got the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Atlanta Hawks. Now, this is where shit really gets interesting. Uh, Marco Ballinelli, not sure if he'll be back after being sent home. He should be, but will he be in the rotation? That's not what you care about. You want to know about the Cavs. At this point, we assume that they won't have their guys they traded for. Rocket Rodney Hood. They won't have uh, Georgie Hill. They won't have uh, Geordie Clarkson. They won't have Larry Nance Jr. They could, but at this point, we're assuming they won't. So minutes are going to be opening up all over the place on this team. So there's a ton of guys that we can look at. It looks like Jose Calderon will be the starter. He's at 4,500. If it was minimum salary, I'd be into it, but at 4,500, I'm probably going to leave Jose alone. Well, Dennis Schroeder gets the good defensive matchup against Calderon. He's at 7,700. That's a, that's a pretty high price for Dennis. I think you can look at that as a tournament play rather than a cash one. At shooting guard, 3,600 for Kyle Korver. Like it for GPPs quite a bit, while the plumber at 4,400, J.R. Smith, has been playing fairly strongly lately. I think you can look at that, but more as a tournament one, while Kent Bazemore always does well against Cleveland. Has struggled. His price is high, but this is the, the he always does well. And I say always by meaning not literally always, but most of the time. And I think it's a great tournament play with 40-point upside here for Kent Bazemore. And you don't say that about him too often. At Small Fort, the artist formerly known as Torian Prince is at 4,500. I am in on him here. Great matchup for him. Yeah, should comfortably stroll to 25 points. On the Cavs side, Chetty Osman at minimum salary just with the players not there and how well he's playing and the, the, the word of their mere trading guys away because of how well he was playing, yeah, I think you have to look at him. I think he's a strong tournament. He's an awesome tournament player. And I think he's also got some cash value. He can do some stuff defensively. He can hit some shots. I like the ability of Osman here with a potentially large role. He's at 11,500. I'm uh, I'm totally fine on that. There's no one else really around on this team that's going to take anything away from him in this game. So all about LeBronald in this one. At power forward, Jeff Green. 
Also, all about Jeff Green. 3,900 for Jeff. That is a cash lock, in my opinion. He's going to have to play big minutes. I, I do like that for Jeff. The Baptist at 5,200. John Collins, some, a strong performance from him today. Was it all because of Ilya Sova's foul trouble, or was it a, a change in, in mentality from Budenholzer? We've yet to see that, but he is a tournament option with the 30, 35 point. Uh, I guess, low volatility upside. At centre, Tristan Thompson at 47. Again, no Channing Fry around. Is it, It's going to be him and Ante Zizic, so you could look at either of those guys as tournament players. I think that even Thompson, you could say, I feel good he's going to get 23 at least, and that makes him a decent cash option. Zizic, at minimum salary, has done just jack shit all season. His highest DFS night has been 15 points. If you want to differentiate yourself, throw him into a tournament, but I, I don't really see it really paying off. Mike Muscala, Miles Plumley, The Undertaker, Dwayne Dedman. I don't really like any of those guys for uh, DFS purposes. On DraftKings, the value's there again. Uh, this is a great stackable game. Zizic is an in- at 3,000. He has more interest over on DraftKings uh, for tournaments. Calderon at 3,200. It looks like a great play. Corver at 38. Formally is at 49, while the Baptist is at 48. Like all of those guys there. For Cash, it's LeBron at 12-1. Even though it's a higher price, he's going to have to do a lot. Schroeder at 7,000. I'm strongly in on. And Baysmore, the same story goes. And Jeff Green at 45. And Chetty Osman at minimum $3,000 are really strong, possibly lock-type players. Let's go on to the next one now. We're going to talk about the Indiana Pacers and the Boston Celtics. The Celtics are favored by four. The total is 204 and a half points. The Celtics coming off a back-to-back. The Pacers, after not having played for a few days due to that uh, postponed game against the New Orleans Pelicans. At point guard, we're going to have Corey Joseph start again. He's at 4,900. He is a low upside play who is not worth that for cash. So he's a fade. Mighty Joe Young at 37. You can absolutely throw Joe Young into a tournament game, but he doesn't have a huge, huge upside. Kyrie's at 8,000. I'm a little bit worried that he's going to be limited on a back-to-back with his minutes. So that would leave me to go in other directions at the point guard spot. While Rozier at 6,500 absolutely can consider him a GPP, especially if they limit Irving on this second night. At shooting guard... We've got uh, Vic Oladipo, 9,700 for Vic. Uh, I don't think this matchup suits him. While Jalen Brown at 5,500, worth a tournament look. And I I say it doesn't suit him. Look, there's no one who's really going to be able to slow him down necessarily. But Celtics team defense has been decent against shooting guards. And Oladipo is probably a little bit overpriced as it is. Uh, Small forwards. Tatum at 5,600, GPP sort of a guy rather than a cash play, while Stevenson at 56 with Oladipo back, a little bit hard to get on board the Lance Stevenson train. Boyan Bogdanovich has been red hot, so you know that's going to come to an end. Don't use him in cash, but tournaments, you can hope for something. But at 5,800, I feel like it's getting a bit high. Power forward, the Deuce Young's at 5,400, hate the matchup. Sabonis at 4,900, don't like the situation for him, while Marcus Morris at 49. Yeah, look, he played a lot of minutes today. We know that much about him, but I don't think that he is a super strong option here. Vanilla Tice at 4,200 also. Yeah, look, and again, big minutes, but I'm not sure it's carrying over to this game. Greggy Munro's at minimum salary. I would absolutely throw him into a tournament. I think he can get minimum value back. Al Horford at 7,400 is worth a look, but not not the strongest play. While Miles Turner at 6,500 has been quite disappointing. If you're going to use Turner, tournaments only would be my recommendation. On DraftKings, again, not much that really stands out. Mighty Joe Young at minimum salary. Oladipo at 8,000, I think, is in a pretty strong spot. I think Irving and Horford are probably a little bit too highly priced, while Miles Turner at 58 is definitely appealing. Tatum and Brown, yeah, they're all right. Rozier at 57 has uh, has some strong value as well, I think, even as a cash option. And I won't be uh, looking too hard at Corey Joseph. The next game up on the slate, we've got the Milwaukee Bucks. And the Miami Heat, the Heat have said that Dwayne Wade is likely to play, so he will be ready to go for this game. His role is going to be an interesting one. I think it impacts Tyler Johnson and the Duke, Wayne Allington, maybe a little bit of Justice Winslow. Not really Josh Richardson. He's clearly their best player. No, actually, not true. Not necessarily clearly, but he is their best player. Uh, it's going to be interesting the Wade Dragic dynamic. Dragic took an absolutely unnecessary backseat to Wade, especially in crunch time. He just go and stand in the corner. If that sort of bullshit returns, then that's going to be a real problem. Uh, we will see how Wade uh, Wade's ego goes in terms of deferring in the right moments. The Muppet John Henson. 
He missed the last game due to a hamstring issue. If he is out, you're going to have... I think you're going to see more Tyler Zeller. You'll see some Marshall Plumley. You'll see some Thon McCurr, and none of them playing enough to really get the uh, DFS waters wet. For the Heat, Kelly Olynyk is doubtful, while the Duke, Wayne Ellington, is probable after missing the last game. At point guard, Tyler Johnson's at 4,200. There is clearly some upside there, but I think the Wade acquisition is going to put a sti- it's going to stifle that. You can you can use it though, definitely as a tournament guy. Dragic at 7,200. The the Wade factor scares me off somewhat there. While Eric Bledsoe at 7,700. Big price rise for Bledsoe. Bad matchup. The Heat have been terrible for point guards to go against all season, so I think Bledsoe is in strong fade territory. At shooting guard, Middleton's at 7,300. Um, Eh, it's it's okay. It's definitely not the best value guy on the board. Uh, I think that he's he's worth looking at, but in most cases he'd be a fade. Joshy e. Richardson's up to seven thousand dollars. I'd feel better using him than say Dragic at a similar price. Um, but again, the, the addition of Wade puts a little bit of a pause as well as that price rise on Josh. Winslow's at forty four hundred. No interest at all at power forward. Jim Johnson with Kelly Olynyk out. He only played. Uh, sorry, he played 36 minutes and only put up 14 points. I think if he plays 36 minutes again, he won't be as limited in his production. At 4,600, he is worth that GPP look. The Muppet at 58, if he plays, I'm happy to use that. While Jabari Parker at 4,000, uh, the minutes are, are the problem there, of course. At center, we've got Hassan Whiteside at 7,600. Whiteside played well in the last game. That salary is a little bit scary, while Adebayo at 45. I'm not really sure that this is uh, the right spot to use him either. There is some tournament value, but I don't think that we'll be uh, getting too invested in uh, in Adebayo nor Thon McCurr for the Milwaukee Bucks. I didn't even talk about Yanni. Yanni is absolutely fine to use, and I love Yanni on DraftKings. 10,500 is a great spot for him. Um, yeah, Bledsoe still fade. Jim Johnson has some value at a $5,100 on DraftKings, and I love Josh Richardson still at $6,200. That is a very, very cheap price. The Muppet at 54 is worth a look, and Tyler Johnson at 48 yeah, I think that's a fade zone as well. The next game we're going to take a look at, we have got the uh, Nuggets. They're taking on the Houston Rockets. The Nuggets made that trade. Moody A out, Devin Harris in. They literally have no point guards on their roster. They've got uh, Jamal Murray. And then they've De- Devin Harris, who hasn't played as a point guard for about three years. They're, I don't know what they're going to do. Is Fart and Will Barton going to play that backup role? They're going to call up Monty Morris. There's a few things that remain in flux. So it's going to be interesting to see how they handle that backup role. I would guess that Barton and Harris have to do some of the ball handling there. And of course, they have Nikola Jokic. Pretty good. It's pretty, 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 pretty good. I think this is a, a strong stackable game for DFS. At point guard, the Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray, is at 6,700. I like him here. Chris Paul defense is a, is a problem, but I think that this has got 30-point floor, 50-point upside for, for Murray. As for Paul himself, 9,900. Absolutely fine in using him in a really strong matchup tournament and cash is worth a look at. Shooting guard, Barton's at 7,400. Quite expensive, but in a ball handling role, starting at small forward, you know, 35 points should be considered almost a minimum for Barton here, so I do like him. Eric Gordon at 55 is a fade. Well, Jim Harden at 11.8. I'm always about Jim. He's a real tough one to go past, especially when he's priced under 12,000. Gaz Harris at 6,500. It's probably just a little bit too high, but I don't hate it, and I think he should be in your tournament pool of players. At small forward, baby neck is a minimum salary. That's Wilson Chandler. Um, yeah, he had five points in the last game. Not intrigued at all. PJ Tucker at 37, played 41 minutes and had eight points. I don't even know how that's possible, but that's where we are with PJ Tucker. Injury-wise, Eric Gordon and Ryan Anderson are both listed as questionable while Trevor Ariza is out. So if Gordo and Anderson are out, you're going to get more Tucker and more Marmute, but that's not really going to move the, move the needle for anybody. At small forward, Torrey Craig's a minimum guy also. Uh, Gerald Green at 4,200 would be a tournament flyer, even if you don't know the status of those other guys. But then if Anderson and Gordon are out, he does gain some value. At power forward, Luke Marmute's at 4,400. You know, I don't see that. Ryan Anderson at 38. Yeah, you know, I don't see that either. Trey Lyles at 5,600. is probably a little bit too highly priced. For the centers, Jokic at 9,900. That's expensive, clearly. 
he can do 50, so I, I do. he can comfortably do 50. I like him for tournaments. I think you, you could actually stretch him to cash out. I don't think he's the best option, but you could. Whereas Clint Capella at 8,100, I'm going to say that's too high for Capella, and I think that that is strongly in the fade territory. On DraftKings, a lot of guys I like for both cash and tournaments. Gaz Harris, the Blue Arrow, Clint Capella, Farton Will Barton, Nick Jokic, and Jim Harden, all putting up, uh, all putting up, or in a situation where they can put up enough value to be cash and tournament players over on DraftKings. Let's go to the next game. It's the Hornets and the Jazz. The Jazz are favored by five and a half, and the total is 207.5. The Jazz acquiring Jay Crowder uh, with Joe Johnson going out. I don't think Crowder is going to play in this one, so there are some minutes opening up for guys like Royce O'Neal. Of course, Rocket Rodney Hood is out of there as well. They did bring in Derek Rose, but Derek Rose won't play for this team. Much to the uh, delight, I guess, of Darren. You would have seen, uh, I think Darren, I apologize if I got the name wrong, Darren. I think it's Darren Muir who uh, tweeted out the video, tweeted it out to me, actually, and uh, a couple of other Jazz guys that uh, as he woke up from his anesthetic and started crying that the Jazz had traded for um, Derek Rose. You would have seen it all over the place now. And apparently I uh, got my uh, Twitter handle up on uh on uh, the TNT show post game, I, I didn't see it. Someone tweeted at me saying that they showed that tweet, and obviously my name was up there on it as he tagged me in it. So Darren, you must be listening to the show. So congratulations on your crying in a hospital bed going viral over Derek Rose. But at least we're on the same way, same wavelength about Derek. Um, yeah, he won't be playing for this team, and neither will Crowder in this game. Rose ever or Crowder just in this game at point guard Kemba. 8,200, an absolute monster from Kemba again today. Slowed down Jazz game. Ricky Rubio defense, I think that's a fade zone. Well, Rubio just killing it on his own, but he is at $8,000. That is a stupid high price for Rubio. And I guess because he's averaging 44 over the last five that you could say it's justified. Now there's no rocket. It's going to be him and Mitchell handling things. Yeah, in a tournament, maybe. I don't have much faith in that being a great cash option, but he is crushing it at a level we've never seen Rubio crush it before. So if you want to use it, and if you believe that it's real, his lowest score in his last five games is 38 points. That is astounding to me. He has been really good, and he could be used. I probably wouldn't. Shooting guards, Alec Burks. 3600 for Berksy. Great opportunity for him. I actually like him at that price. A great minimum guy to fit in alongside your Jim Hardens or your LeBrons or your Giannis's to get that cheap guy in. Taking that hood roll. Uh, Don Mitchell, the Don, 7,500 has been piss poor lately. I'm all for using him here, though. He had 41, the last, 42, sorry, the last time against Charlotte. Totally in on him. Well, Nick Batum at 6,200. Uh, back to back for Batum. Slow down defense. Joe Ingles defense. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fade him here. Small four. Jingle and Joe's at 4,700. I like this for him, mainly just because Crowd is not around. He's going to have to take on a little bit of extra offensive role with Rocket also gone. Uh, I like this one for Joe. I think it's worth using him. Kid Gilchrist, no. Royce O'Neal, another GPP target at 4,000 who could see that role and take on those Joe Johnson or Rod Hood minutes. Uh, power forwards, we've got uh, Derek Favors at 5,500. That's stupid cheap for Favors. I'm all about that. I think that's worth using in cash. Maybe not so much tournament upside, but I do like Favors at that price. Frank the Tank at 4,000 had a good game today, but I don't think we should look into that too much while Marvin Williams not happening. At center, Gobert and Howard. 7,700 for Rudy, 8,200 for Dwight. Going up against each other, I'm going to fade both of them. Although... Centers going against either of these teams recently have been up putting up above average performances. Maybe you could look at using them as a GPP stack. I wouldn't want to do it in cash, but in a GPP stack, I could see using both of these guys, and maybe it turns out. On DraftKings, I like the Don at 6,900 and Rubio at 71. They are both really strong options there. Favors at 52, also in a good situation, while uh, Gobert at 68. Yeah, not feeling too much excitement about him over on DraftKings. Let's round this very busy day out by going through the last two games, the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Chicago Bulls. Jimmy Butler, Tom Thibodeau, Taj Gibson all returning back to Chicago. Marcus George's hunt missed the last game with an illness. That's His four minutes aren't going to make or break what happens in DFS. Robin Lopez was ejected in the last game, but he'll be ready to go. At point guard, interesting things the Bulls said that after the break, they're going to start limiting their veterans. They have one veteran. It's Robin Lopez. 
Uh, I don't know if they're going to count Jaron Grant in that. He is a third-year point guard. Apparently, they're going to give campaign minutes, so I would think it would have to come at the expense of Grant, and they're going to be giving minutes to Felicio and Zipsa. So what does this mean for Punch Bob Shiploke? Does he get some minutes reduced there as Felicio and Zipsa get their minutes uh, ramped up? Oh, they've got Ashik as a veteran, but he was never going to play anyway. So the only guy in their, in their rotation who's old is Lopez. So there's a real is going to be a real struggle for him to get consistent minutes from here on out. 5,200 for Jaron Grant. He's getting a lot of minutes uh, with Chrissy Dunn sidelined. He's not doing a huge amount, but I think that, that he's worth looking at without using as a lock guy. While Jeffy Teague at 61, uh, had 42 in that last game, Jeff. Not bad, but uh, I think there are better guys that are out there. Tyus Jones at 35, we won't be using him. Wigo at 6,200. I like this spot for Wigo. It's a great matchup for him. Absolutely fine with tournamenting him. While Justin Holiday, or maybe he's the other veteran along with Robin Lopez that could see their minutes reduced. So at 5,300, I'd be really hesitant about using him. Zach Levine, 72. The price has risen for Zachy. He's against his former team. He looks to be rolling at the moment. I wouldn't have any concern with rolling him out there. He's looking good. Jamal Crawford at 3,700. Not really happening. At small forward, Jim Butler, 9. 9,800. Let's go with Jim here. Um, yeah, he's crushing it. It's a good matchup. He's a great player. 50 points. Should be beckoning for Butler. I'm all about using him here. The Hammer, Denzel Valentine, 45. Probably not. Nwaba, Bielitsa, Zipsa. No. Power forward, Taj Gibson, 5,800. I don't. I still don't mind it for cash. He hasn't quite been the level at that. It, he hasn't quite been at the level that he was earlier in the season. But he's still got some cash value. While Punch Bob Shiplokes at 6,200, absolutely fine to use him despite the negative matchup here. Jeng's at 36. I don't think we get into that too much. At center, Townsy, 9,400. Great matchup. Fine. Absolutely no worries. Robin Lopez, no interest. And Chris Felicio, no interest either. Over on to DraftKings. Levine at 61 is a stone-cold lock. Jaron Grant at 5,000, also a good play. Punch Bob at 57, supreme. Wigo at 63, not as interesting. Larry Markinen's back. I didn't talk about him. I don't like him really on Fangio, and I'm not a big fan here on DraftKings, but you could tournament him there. Jim Butler at 96 and Townsy at 93 are both strong options. Let's go now to the last game of the day. It is the Portland Trailblazers and the Sacramento Kings. The Blazers are favored by six, and the total is 208.5 points. Darren Fox is probable with that sprained left ankle, and Garrett Temple is questionable after having oral surgery. The Kings made some um, moves. I don't understand trading away Malachi Richardson. I don't understand waving your just Papianis. They apparently were they got Bruno Caboclo and they're going to wave him, but now apparently they're not going to wave him. George Hill is gone. Iman Shumpert's in town. I don't know, just a whole bunch of uh, of weird moves. Is Shumpert part of the rotation? Does he fall into the veterans that rest and now don't rest? I think what does happen, though, is the role for Rand. Rand I think Randolph's going to play every night now from now on because uh, you know, Papianis is gone. They're, they're not committed to developing that front court there. Lebissier's still out. It's still going to be really shit show based stuff. More minutes come for uh, De'Aaron Fox a little bit. He's still getting big minutes, but George Hill's not there. It helps uh, Bogdan Bogdanovic, but again, not not in a in a massive way. He was still getting his minutes. Now, Frank Mason will be back soon to take that backup point guard role. For now, Garrett Temple is going to be the one handling the duties there. Shabazz Napier at 3,900. Blowout potential GPP option. Lillard at 9,000 can easily have value even in limited minutes, while De'Aaron Fox at 54. I'd look at him more as a tournament guy here. I wouldn't be overloading my exposure. CJ McCollum at 72. Good matchup for CJ. Absolutely fine to use him for cash. Temple at 42. I think if Temple plays at 42, there's a real chance that he exceeds that value. So he is a decent tournament guy, while Bogdan's at 56, and I like Bogdan for cash and for tournaments. Budrick, 5,200. Nope. Pat Connaughton, minimum salary. No, also. Mo Harkless, I don't care for at minimum salary. Evan Turner at 36. I'm going to fade them both. While Justin Jackson at 37. He's getting some minutes, but he's not doing enough with them. So if you're going to use him, it's tournaments only. At power forward, Al Farouk Aminu. They, they also, I didn't mention, they also did get the uh, Joe Johnson, the Kings, but they're going to waive him most likely. So he's not going to be playing. 
The Chief, Al Farouk Aminu, 5,500, had a big game today. It's actually a strong strong little run of games. I don't hate using him. Actually, I think it's not a bad cash play and tournament play, although me saying Aminu and cash probably means he's going to do nothing. Randolph at 6,500, I think is worth a look, even in cash, while Eddie Davis at 38, probably not happening for me there. At center, Nurks at 66. Love the upside play here. Absolutely love it. Tournaments for sure. Corley Stein at 6,900. Um, I think that's more tournament than cash. I, I could use Nurk in cash and feel a level of confidence that maybe I wouldn't have felt a while ago. On DraftKings, I like Randolph for 57 a ton. That's a great option. Bogdan at 49 is also good. I think Darren Fox is too high at 6,000. Nurkic at 6,000 is also pretty strong. And McCullum and Lillard are both cash options over on DraftKings. Let's have a look at, uh, at Yahoo for tournaments. Uh, I've got Torian Prince, Bogdan Bogdanovich, Kyle Korver, Jose Calderon, Chetty Osman, The Plumber, J.R. Smith, Ed Davis, Joe Young. Uh, and for cash, we're looking at Tyler Dorsey, Alec Burks, Tony Tolliver, Corey Joseph, Reggie Bullock, Tristan Thompson, Jeff Green, Stan Johnson, Nick Jokic, Vic Oladipo, Chris Paul, and LeBron James. No money ball yet because at the time of recording, they hadn't put up their NBA contests. At Draft Stars for tournaments, I've got Nick Miritich, Zach Randolph, Jaron Grant, Reggie Bullock, Ant- Ante Zizic, Mighty Joe Young. And for cash, we've got Tyler Dorsey, Corey Joseph, Chetty Osman, Anthony Tolliver, Jose Calderon, Tristan Thompson, Kyle Corver, Jeff Green, The Baptist, Derek Favors, Stan Johnson, Willie Cauley-Stein, Schroeder, The Don, Dwight Howard, Oladipo, Jokic, and LeBron James. That does it for another episode, your second episode today of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Go back and listen to that trade deadline show, of course. Hit me up. I apologize. So many, so many friggin' notifications today that I couldn't get to everyone's individual ad drop questions about those guys. My thoughts are covered in this podcast. They're covered in my tweets. They're covered uh, in that earlier podcast as well. Good luck for your lineups for the weekend, for DFS and for seasonal leagues. If you do listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts and you enjoy it, go and leave leave a five-star review. Even if you dislike it, go and leave a five-star review. You got to the end, so it couldn't be that bad. You can also find this show on Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, and on Spotify and on YouTube where you can leave a thumbs up and leave a comment and subscribe while you're at it. Check out the rest of the Locked On Podcast Network at Locked On NBA Net, Basketball Monster at Basque Monster, and I am Josh Lloyd, and you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. CJ McCollum.